Hi, my name is Deshawn Carter, a policy analyst on the higher education team here at New America. Two cases currently sit with SCOTUS, Student for Fair Admissions versus Harvard College and Student for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina, which could likely ban colleges and universities uh, from considering race in their admissions process. If SCOTUS decides to overturn affirmative action, we can expect to see many damaging and rippling effects throughout the higher education system and other institutions. Here at New America, we acknowledge that we are not experts on affirmative action. However, we are very dedicated to making higher education more equitable and accountable, fighting for inclusion rather than exclusion, so that everyone can obtain an affordable, high quality education. Therefore, we are very committed to using our platform to uplift those with deep expertise and knowledge to raise awareness and spark cohesive dialogue on creating policies to ensure that higher education institutions are a guiding light in embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want to welcome Dr. Liliana Garces, a professor at the University of Texas School of Law and with the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy. Her work has been focused on race and equity in higher education. Don't want to say too much because I do want to give her the floor to share more about her work. Um, so thank you so much again, Dr. Liliana Garces, um, for joining me on this, this call today. Um, I'm very interested to learn more about your work and you know what brought you into this particular policy space. Thank you so much. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to join this important conversation. So I'll just say broadly, my, my research, my work examines how law and education systems come together to shape opportunity or exacerbate inequality for historically marginalized populations in higher education, particularly for students of color. And I came to my work as, as an academic and researcher after having worked in law for about five years. My partner likes to call me a recovering lawyer. Um, and it was my personal journey that really brought me uh, to my work in law. Um, and in, in that journey itself is what motivated my interest to then work in education. Um, I'm someone who started from very humble beginnings. I grew up in a very small farm in, in Colombia and South America, and I immigrated with my mom to the US. Um, she came as a single mom. I was about 11. I, we made the very dangerous journey, actually without documents, um, and I didn't speak any English at the time. And about less than 20 years uh, later, I was working for the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, advocating for the constitutional rights of other immigrants uh, before the highest court in the nation, the U.S. Supreme Court. And the journey from where I began um, to that moment uh, really represents the very best of what our education system has to offer uh, to open up opportunity uh, and help individuals realize their highest aspirations. But we know that that's not the case for the majority of students of color in our country, uh, where education really serves to close doors of opportunity um, and oftentimes entrench racial and ethnic inequities. Um, and so after working as a lawyer and um, realizing my highest aspirations, um, I wanted to really dedicate that next stage of my career to help education uh, really serve this role of opening opportunity rather than in further entrench inequities. Um, and, and all really the motivation for my work, um, everything that drives it is a, a democratic theory of, of education, a working assumption that our racial in our racial and ethnically diverse democracy, individuals with diverse set of experiences should really be helping shape laws and policies that affect us all. Uh, but we know that the majority of individuals who are in positions of power and influence are predominantly white. And as long as that remains the case, we end up with a system of racial hierarchy um, where selective institutions, you know, where students of color are severely underrepresented, um, provide pathways to positions of power and influence in the United States. And so a large part of my work as an educational researcher has focused on examining policies that are intended to provide to provide pathways of opportunity uh, to these places, to these selective places that um, are providing those um, pathways to positions of power and influence in our in our society. And policies like affirmative action has been um, an important part uh, that has served this um, goal in our society. 
Um, and so it's a critical study uh, area for, for studying access and, and equity in higher education. And not just because it's a policy that has opened up access and opportunity with an original intent of helping level the playing field, um, but because when we talk about legal and policy debate around these, um, this topic, it really has a much larger and lasting deep influence um, outside of not just admissions, but in other practices. Uh, and really just reflects debates about how we as a society address racial discrimination and a history of racial oppression, um, how we engage in thinking about merit, who's meritorious, um, how we engage with questions of race and power and identity. Um, so that's to frame generally my work and how I came to this area of study. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, again, yeah, like I said, thank you for sharing your journey. Um, and you made a couple of great points about, you know, opportunity and, you know, the history of this country's um, yeah, when it comes to denying people access to just basic and vital resources and in institution. Um, so I want to get into talking a little bit more about, you know, what is the previous cases um, of, around affirmative action. So this is not the first time a legal challenge, you know, the race conscious missions has come up. Um, do you see any differences um, between the Harvard and UNC cases with like Fisher versus Texas? Are there any similarities? And do you think the higher education policy arena <clears throat> has changed since affirmative action was last on the chopping block? Well, I would say that these are cases that have come back to the court um, in light of a very well-coordinated effort to bring the issue back to the Supreme Court at a time when we have a changed composition and the votes to interpret the law in a way that really limits the consideration of race altogether. Um, there's been a lot of different challenges to the policy, but all these prior challenges haven't fully been successful in limiting the consideration of race altogether. They have already shaped the practice in a way that's already limited, uh, but we are at a time when three of the justices of three of the justices on the court, who was recently as 2016 with the Fisher case, voted to uphold the constitutionality of the practice, um, have since each left the court. And each of them has been replaced by a conservative justice appointed by former President Trump. Um, and they're all expected to form a new majority as they join longer standing justices um, who in the past have criticized the practice. Uh, so, that's really what's new with these new legal cases. Um, in addition to having a strategy of, um, with the Harvard case, having an Asian American plaintiff, um, which in arguments that really rely on um, perpetuating a lot of myths and stereotypes about Asian Americans and, and divisions uh, among communities of color. Um, but in terms of where we are with the law, I think it's important to remember that we have, we've had a series of cases already that have really limited what institutions can do with affirmative action. Um, in fact, I don't really think that what we have in place right now, we can call affirmative action. What we have in place is a type of race consciousness um, that preserves the ability for students of color to present their full selves. Um, it is far from the type of policy that affirmatively addresses any kind of past or ongoing consequences of racial discrimination. Um, in the past, when we think about the original beginnings of affirmative action and, you know, it, it, you know beginning with an executive order issued by President Johnson back in 1965 that required federal contractors to, including public universities, to take affirmative steps to promote the full realization of equal opportunity for women and for people of color. Really the intent there was to help level the playing field. Um, but that's an approach that the court already closed off back in 1978 with Baki, which struck down that approach um, as unconstitutional. And what we have in place is a, um, a diluted form 
of, of affirmative action, which I think at most we would just call race consciousness. Um, and it really is a very commonsensical approach to admissions. It's an approach that considers all aspects of an individual's identity, uh, including race or ethnic background. Um, these are all factors that end up shaping our experiences, especially in a society where um, race and ethnicity really matters for shaping educational experiences and opportunities. Um, and so when you're not able to, um, to consider those experiences, you end up denying students, especially students of color, uh, marginalized students, the ability to present their full selves. Um, and, um, and, and you're asking them to not really identify an important dimension of their multifaceted identity that ends up then leading us in a place where we're discriminating against a particular population um, instead of trying to provide a very commonsensical approach that um, allows us to consider everybody's experiences. Um, the other thing that is, I would say, related but maybe slightly different with, with these cases, in addition to having a very changed composition in the Supreme Court, is that the plaintiffs are presenting arguments that um, rely on these racial stereotypes about Asian Americans. Um, that try to prioritize standardized test scores um, as the primary, if not the sole measure of a student's merit, of what, what is deserving of admission at selective institutions. Uh, but we know from a large body of research that these are measures that are far from objective measures of merit, uh, potential, or talent. Uh, they really end up being more highly correlated to family wealth and resources. Um, and this is something that institutions of higher education have started to realize as they um, begin to make tests, um, uh, their admissions practices become test optional or just not um, require them altogether. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the two, I think, main things that I would say about these new cases. Yeah. And how they, and how they fit into the development of what's already been constrained, uh, constrained, and, and now trying to eliminate the consideration of race altogether. Yeah, thank you for sharing because it's it just seems like this issue will continue to come up over the years, um, and it's just yeah, it's like twenty five years later, ten years later, and we're steadily seeing the same issue uh, come up. And th yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, one well, of and Yep. Sorry, as I said too, it's connected to our our struggle as a society and how we engage mm -hmm. in these issues. And so it's not surprising that it it it, it comes back um, in ebbs and flows as we um, debate this at the highest levels of the Supreme Court. Yeah, and with also the shift in our our politics too, and like you said, who's sitting on the court and the shift in certain states, which I'm about to get into next, um, about certain states who have banned affirmative action. And I'm thinking about California and Michigan, particularly, um, you know, both have acknowledged that they have seen a decrease in diversity on their campuses, especially at their flagship and selective universities. What can we learn from these states and what should federal policymakers know? Well, the substantial body of research um, shows, including some of my own work, um, which has looked at what has happened with enrollment of underrepresented students, uh, minoritized students at um, in graduate fields of study, for example. Um, and we um, we see that these bans on affirmative action in states like uh, Michigan, California, and others have led to um, substantial declines in the enrollment of um, minoritized communities um, across uh, a number of educational sectors um, in at selective undergraduate schools and graduate fields of study, um, which have been my own, uh, my own studies. And that cuts across fields like engineering, the natural sciences, social sciences, the humanities, um, also at schools of medicine who are training future doctors uh, who are going to need to be equipped to serve a multiracial democracy uh, in society. Um, in law schools, at schools of medicine, um, as mentioned, uh, sorry, at business schools as well. Um, these are all studies and a substantial body of research that has been presented in arguments before the court. They came uh, before the court in 
last in 2016 when the issue was last um, deliberated before uh, these more recent cases. Um, and what it would require for the court in the way that I know many expect, given the um, ideological makeup and the change composition, is that, um, you know, just to be clear, it would really require extraordinary steps for the court to, um, to create a shift in the very commonsensical approach in admissions. Um, it, the court would need to ignore that large body of evidence. It would um, also need to overrule 40 years of precedent um, and overlook all the evidence that the trial court has um, the trial courts at both the, the trial and the Court of Appeals and the Harvard case, um, at least, um, carefully considered. And when you look at the evidence, it's about 250 pages of meticulous legal analysis uh, combined. Um, and, and you have also the interest of the business community, the professional fields of law, medical community, the U.S. Armed Services, all of um, all organizations that I have continued to try to defend a very limited consideration of race um, in their policies because um, they are, they play, they have deemed race conscious policies to play a very critical role in helping serve their goals and mission. Um, and so these are all a, a very large body of evidence um, and research that the court would need to ignore um, in, in, if it were to um, overrule uh, prior precedent. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> um, and as someone who is, uh, you know, interested in data and policy, it's like the evidence is right there. And for them to ignore that, that would be completely insane. Um, and still talking about, I guess, states, um, still on the same line of ground states, um, you know, many interesting and peculiar things are coming out of Florida and Texas, um, especially around their DEI efforts. Do you see their actions as a precursor to what we might see unfold nationwide affirmative action is overturned? And what is at stake for higher education institutions and their current DEI efforts? Yeah, so, you know, these uh, proposed uh, bills and legislation that has passed um, target that, that's targeting uh, diversity, equity, inclusion efforts they're targeting not just what happens in admissions, but what happens throughout the educational journey after students are admitted. And um, these are really efforts that are intended to expand the reach of the Supreme Court decisions on affirmative action beyond just admissions. The problem is that diversity is, and you know, realizing the educational benefits of diversity, um, it's not just about numbers of students on campus. It's really about um, the educational experiences that students are able to engage in. Um, in my scholarship, I uh, call this um, dynamic diversity, right? It's not just um, having a, a critical mass of students on, on campus um, who come you know, from uh, marginalized communities or you know, students of color, but really about the engagement across racial difference among students. Um, we have decades of diversity and inclusion related research that consistently shows that um, programming and support to help those cross racial interactions is essential for realizing the benefits of um, diverse learning environments like helping build critical thinking skills, preparing future leaders to lead in a multiracial democracy, uh, helping break down racial stereotypes, promoting cross-racial understanding, um, and just having students of color and increasing the numbers and, and sort of on campus on its own doesn't result in these benefits um, or for white students in choosing to interact with people of, of different racial backgrounds. Um, rather, what we need is the kind of interaction that is um, that can provide those long-term benefits. And, and DEI programming helps across all those efforts. You need um, not just numeric uh, representation, but a positive or, or a healthy campus climate. Um, and that's what those, uh, that programming can help um, facilitate, assess, 
uh, support faculty to become better equipped in addressing impediments to productive interactions, like when you have a um, small number of students of color in a, in, in, a, in a classroom, for example, when we think about racial stereotypes or, or tokenism and, and becoming more aware of how to overcome some of these barriers and support the educational experiences um, for, for all students in that space to help really realize the benefits of diversity is what all those efforts are about. Um, and so, in the same way that considering race as a factor in admissions has been really central to achieving the mission of institutions of higher education, that is exactly what diversity, equity, and inclusion programming and policies uh, do. They help realize the, the mission of institutions of higher education for providing a high quality education for all students, for opening doors of, of opportunity and, um, and supporting the educational experiences in a way that is promoting the mission of the institution. Um, so yeah, I think what's at stake for institutions of higher education is really their mission and their ability to help sustain and contribute to a healthy democracy. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think you kind of answered my next question about you know diversity, equity, inclusion, and also belonging is so important to have on college campuses. I mean, it's like you said, it's one thing to admit the student, but we also have to be able to provide those supports for those students to stay there and also follow through and succeed. Um, so thank you for sharing, because it seems like with what's going on in, I would say, most conservative leaning states is that it's like so many like laws are just coming out or bills are being you know pushed through or introduced day by day to like ban diversity and, equity and inclusion like through the whole entire education system. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, kind of want to jump into, I guess, a little bit more about the decision overall. So what would you like the general public to take away from what is unfolding? And what is one hope and also one fear you have about the upcoming decision? So in terms of what is unfolding, I would come back to understanding that this is really a very important debate that relates to how do we tackle racial inequity in our society? Do we do that by attending to the ways in which race really shapes opportunity and, um, and, and educational trajectories um, and address that head on? Um, or do we do it by um, ignoring um, or, or thinking that we can overcome those inequities by not addressing it directly. Um, I think these are two perspectives that are at play with, with the kind of fundamental arguments um, that these cases represent. And grounded in what we know from research is that when we don't attend to the way that race shapes educational opportunity, we end up exacerbating those inequities. Um, so we don't get to um, a place where race no longer matters by not looking at race and the way that it actually matters so that we can tackle it head on. Um, in terms of, I'll start with the fear. I think um, my, one of my greatest fears is, well, the, the, the larger sphere is that um, this is really going to undermine a healthy multiracial democracy. Um, connecting back to the very fundamental role that institutions of higher education play in helping um, provide a high quality education for all students and providing pathways of opportunity for leadership and, um, and influence uh, areas of influence in our society um, in helping reduce the racial prejudice and stereotypes that we carry and creating um, leaders who are more prepared to address the needs of a multiracial society. So that's one of kind of like a, a large fear, a more, um, another fear, which is related to lessons from my research is that even if we have a favorable ruling, let's say, or, or maybe a narrow ruling, that the decision would be interpreted more broadly than, this, than it calls for. Because um, legal decisions don't implement themselves. 
all of us in various roles at institutions and administrators, faculty, um, give them meaning through the ways in which they come to be enacted. Um, and that meaning is gonna have very important consequences for democracy overall. And what I've learned from my research is that administrators can interpret or implement a decision more restrictively than necessary. Um, even when we have a policy that doesn't prevent a particular practice, it can still lead to responses that are motivated by fear um, and not the decision itself. Um, I've seen that in studies that um, have looked at institutions that have chosen, for example, to not have race conscious admissions, even if they're in states that allow for it. Um, and I've seen it in responses of um, the work of administrators, for example, who are charged with supporting an educational environment for students um, after they're admitted. And they're in a state, for example, where a ban on affirmative action has passed. They all of a sudden, they feel like they can't talk about race or engage in those efforts even when that work is outside the context of admissions, right? So the policy has to do with admissions, but it's taken an effect in other areas of the institution. Um, so my concern is that, um, that a decision would be um, lead to kind of overcorrection in the way that um, programming and policies happen on campus in admissions and in other areas as well. Um, and and so we really need to understand how the law can really help, uh, can, can shape our actions in ways that um, end up having these really uh, powerful um, influence on, on actions that undermine equity and inclusion uh, more restrictively than, than necessary. Um, I guess one hope is that um, we can think about what new um, practices um, we need that can come from a more expansive view than what the legal framework has already circumscri circumscribed. So I know there's a lot of concern around how, how might the decision further restrict our work, but we need to remember that prior decisions have already restricted mm -hmm. the work of racial equity. And those restrictions have had to happen with this narrow opening of diversity and attending to the educational benefits of diversity, the forward-looking benefits of this. But that has come with some trade-offs. And in some ways, I think it's an area that has left us less fluent in how we talk about race and racial inequities, um, almost in a place of being too comfortable and not um, maybe require, not engaging the creativity that we need um, to really ta tackle the very fundamental problems um, of, of racial inequity in our society and in the role that institutions of higher education can play in addressing them. Um, so my hope is that we can realize the opportunity that the challenge might present uh, by becoming what I like to call more racially literate. Um, and mm -hmm. this is a term that comes from um, legal scholar Lonnie Guineer, um, who uh, is a former mentor of mine. And, um, and she talks about the importance of, um, of being racially literate, of understanding how um, structures in our society shape um, inequity, how race and class and power intersect, and, um, and how all these pieces need to be attended to um, so, so that um, we can address these really uh, fundamental issues in our society. And one of the really fundamental, I think, um, aspects that will require a reimagination from institutions of higher education is um, this question of merit and how we capture it in admissions, how what we attend to in that at that stage is actually aligned with what we value in um, as an institution in the contribution that we want to provide. So how is the mission of and values of an institution aligned with what's considered 
um, at the point of admission. Uh, so if you think of it as an incentive system that is rewarding the actions that we care about, then how are those factors aligned with values of a democracy of the, um, if we think about maybe the ability to co cooperate with one another, uh, to think creatively, to, um, to face um, obstacles and overcome them, to just to name a few of the pieces that, that as a society we value, then those are the factors that we should be uh, considering in, in admissions and, and addressing other pieces that might be in place that are creating inequities that for too long, affirmative action or race conscious admissions has been more of a band-aid on mm -hmm. um, a system. Uh, and um, yeah, so my hope is that we can realize that opportunity that a potentially more restrictive decision will, will help us um, come to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing all those great, they're all great nuggets. Uh, I was like, oh, wow. I was like, I always had like a follow up to each one, but you, you, you made a lot of great, interesting points about, especially the point that, that I resonate with so much is with reimagining institutions. And like you said, taking the bandaid off, like the bandaid, it's just affirmative action is like a bandaid to like, okay, let's patch things up. Let's patch up our systems to try to make this sound cute and that we're trying to support communities of color, but we're really not, but it needs to go, like the action has to go further than just affirmative action. Um, so thank you for sharing all those great nuggets. Um, my next question, I think you maybe already touched on a lot of, a lot of things, but I wanna think more towards what federal policy could look like. You know, at New America, we are focused on federal policy, just given our location being in Washington, DC. Um, what would you like Congress and the White House to know about the fallout in affirmative actions overturn? And how could the decision affect federal policy? And what can Congress do to maintain and improve access for students of color? Ah, oh, this is a this is a large question. Deshana, this is not one that I'm fully prepared. <laughs> no, it's it's this it's fine. Take it. your, take, <laughs> no, take your time. This edit. is like, like I said, it's I know it's a lot uh to take in but yeah we will be interested in i mean i'm interested but also i think the general public is interested in what you know what can congress and the white house do like to just making sure that we're ensuring that students of color from all walks of life um mm -hmm. have their equal opportunity um you know yeah it's secured for them yeah yeah i you know so much i think begins at the k-12 level um, and making sure that uh, we're we're funding schools in a way that is providing um, the rigorous academic training um, where students are prepared to engage in um, the types of um, yeah, sorry, this is too large of a question for me. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. No, take your yeah, time. Yeah, I think I think one of the um, important parts that I don't know how you get at this through federal policy, but we do need to incentivize, I think, public institutions in a way that um, can help align with what needs to happen in what is valued at the point of admissions. And um, things like the um, rankings, right? Here's where I'm not sure how policy connects um, to what the current rankings are, but we should be ranking institutions on how um, racially diverse are their student bodies? What is the educational experiences that they're providing? What are the employment opportunities that they're providing? Um, across across race and in kind of promoting these um, these goals of um, of what institutions of higher education should be doing and contributing to a multiracial democracy. So whatever those policies are, I think they need to incentivize a different um, approach in admissions that um, really attends to what that alignment needs to be. Yeah, and I think I think you answered it perfectly. Um, transparency, I think that's one thing <clears throat> about universities and institutions of higher education is that we need to be more, more transparent and vocal about what is going on on the actual campuses because 
as a student of color, as someone who identifies as a student of color, once myself, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about if are you going to be able to see students that look like you and you see someone or faculty that look like you, I think that's so important to have on campus and also be very transparent about at these universities, because a lot of these students who are going to these college campuses, they're going for the first time. They're first generation students and they have no idea of what's yet to come when they step foot onto that campus. And I think just having some type of sense of belonging on the campus is a start to just making sure that they're on the right path for post-secondary success. But yeah. Um, yeah. I would also, I would add that um, it'll be really important too to make sure, you know, there's the the kind of usual, usual areas of um, financial aid, right? Making sure that um, we're doing that um, equitably uh, given the, the different contexts for different populations. But when we think about other sectors in higher education, like historically black colleges and universities, uh, minority serving institutions who are also training and uh, providing those pathways for in our society for future leaders and uh, future doctors or future lawyers, they need much better funding uh, to be able to, um, cause you know, from, I'm not an expert in that area, but um, these are spaces where students feel a sense of belonging and are, um, are empowered and are learning um, great things, but institutions are doing that with a lot less resources than selective institutions. So um, mm -hmm. I think targeting efforts um, toward these really important uh, places is also um, should be a priority. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Um, yeah, like I said, myself, New America, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and talk about what what the future of higher education is going to be when come June 30th is when we'll find, hear the decision. Um, so thank you so much again. And yeah, I, I really appreciate this. Thank you so much, Deshaun, for the invitation. I really appreciated it too.